Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter Jr. and John Russell. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Wild animal experts say increasing reports of snow leopard sightings in Pakistan show that conservation efforts there are working. But the COVID-19 crisis is threatening the success of the effort in the northern mountains. The nonprofit Baltistan Wildlife Conservation and Development Organization has worked for more than 20 years to save the endangered cats. The BWCDO partners with several American charities on the effort. About 8,000 snow leopards are believed to exist in the wild. Fewer than 400 of them live in Pakistan, mostly in the Gilgit-Baltistan area. The BWCDO is working with the local population to help protect the species, including setting up insurance systems to pay farmers whose animals are attacked by snow leopards. Gula Muhammad leads the organization. He says it is working with the United States-based ICRA Fund on conservation education programs for Gilgit-Baltistan communities. But the new coronavirus pandemic has affected financial support for these projects. Ghulam Muhammad said this may be harmful to the snow leopard conservation campaign. Last month, BWCDO and the White Lion Foundation of Britain released a video of the call of a wild snow leopard in Pakistan's Karakoram Mountains. John Knight from TWLF said, the adult male is exercising his vocal calls to establish territory and to let females know he is in the area. Knight added that the video is extremely unusual because snow leopards are naturally private creatures. They only come together to mate and raise their young. Ghulam Muhammad said the video was recorded in February by cameras set up to observe the wild snow leopard population in the area. His team reported seeing a mother cat and her two young the following month. The BWCDO leader said a mother and two cubs, especially so late in the season, tells us that snow leopard numbers are growing and that our method of creating a means for local communities to benefit from conservation or at the very least promising and at best successful. BWCDO is helping villagers build secure barriers to reduce snow leopard attacks. The organization also provides farm animal vaccination programs to reduce loss. Researchers say the BWCDO's work has helped protect and conserve a population of large wild goats called markors. They also live in the high mountains of northern Pakistan. Snow leopards hunt markors. If there are enough markors, the big cats will be less likely to kill farm animals for food. 
The U.S.-based Snow Leopard Conservancy also has been an important financial supporter of the BWCDO. Current projects are supported through the end of this year. But Ghulam Muhammad noted no one knows what might happen with financial needs after 2020. An estimated 3,650 snow leopards were killed over the last 10 years. In many cases, the killers were illegal hunters involved in the trade of animal skins and other body parts. However, the White Lion Foundation says more than half were killed in answer to snow leopard attacks on farm animals. Is there any place on Earth not affected by COVID-19? The Reuters news agency found that 214 countries and territories have had at least one case of COVID-19, the disease caused by the coronavirus. Of these, 190 have also had the virus spread within their communities. There have been deaths in at least 166 countries. By the end of April, 33 countries and territories have not reported any cases of new coronavirus infections. Just because a nation has not reported an infection does not mean there have been no cases there. For example, North Korea has not reported any coronavirus cases. The country is bordered by China, Russia, and South Korea. All three are dealing with a large number of cases, suggesting the virus may have made it into the secretive state. Most of the places that have not reported a case are small and hard-to-reach island nations in the Pacific Ocean. They have names like Nauru, Tuvalu, Pitcairn, Tokelau, and Niue. They are also some of the least populated places in the world. American Samoa, Vanuatu, Micronesia, and Solomon Islands also count themselves among the coronavirus-free places in the Pacific. In Europe, many countries and territories started to report cases of the virus from late February to early March, except for two island areas. The Åland Islands are off the coast of Finland, and Svalbard and Jan Mayen Islands north of Norway are two island territories with few people living there. Hard-to-reach islands in the South Atlantic with no reported virus cases include South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands. All countries in the Americas and the Middle East have had at least one case of COVID-19. By March, the virus started to reach Africa, but appeared to spare the islands of Comoros and St. Helena. The new coronavirus has infected more than three million people around the world. It is blamed for nearly 230,000 deaths, and it has damaged the economies of countries and territories worldwide. As the outbreak continues in surrounding nations, some islands have closed their borders and taken measures to prevent the spread of the deadly virus.
I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Person-to-person communications have changed a lot over the past few months. Stay-at-home orders and travel restrictions have limited travel and face-to-face contact. In place of these, many people now use computer software apps such as Zoom, Skype, and Google Hangouts. This technology will be the subject of our everyday grammar story today. The American television show Saturday Night Live has used video calling in its most recent programs. Often, technology is behind the humor in each short sketch. Consider this example. A television show broadcasts a live interview with a news reporter. The reporter's teenage daughter is filming him on her mobile phone. She uses unusual Snapchat filters to film her father. He does not realize what she is doing. Um, If you're just tuning in, the funny filters on Brian are not us. Yeah, my daughter said the camera looks fine, so not sure what's going on, guys. These lines give you an example of a common grammatical feature of video calls. Linking verbs. Linking verbs are verbs that link an adjective or noun with a subject. Let me explain. Imagine you are on a video call. One person might say, the sound is good. The verb be links the adjective good with the subject of the sentence, the sound. Linking verbs are generally used to describe a state of existence or a change of state. So, in the example sentence, by saying, the sound is good, the speaker is describing the quality of the video's sound. Other kinds of linking verbs show changes of state or condition. We will explore that issue a little later in the program. The good news for you is this. There are not too many linking verbs. English speakers use maybe 20 or 30 of them in everyday speech. Examples include verbs such as seem, appear, or become, as well as verbs of the senses, sound, feel, taste, and so on. The words go and get are often used as linking verbs. As linking verbs, they generally carry a bad or negative meaning. They suggest a change to a negative state and usually go with adjectives that have a negative meaning. Imagine you hear someone describe what happened after a failed video call. He got angry after something went wrong with the video. In the example, the linking verb got connects the adjective angry with the subject he. Got shows that the person's emotional state changed. The sentence also has a second linking verb, went, the past tense of go. It links the word something with the adjective wrong. Any number of sentences with linking verbs could be used in a video call or to describe a video call. Imagine you are talking to a friend who is beginning to suffer from Zoom fatigue, a term that means growing tired of using Zoom too much. Your friend might say, I have to go now, I'm getting tired, or... I need to take a break. I'm getting frustrated. As I said before, and as the examples show, linking verbs are generally followed by an adjective or a noun. In other words, they do not usually end sentences. 
Keep that point in mind if you try writing sentences with linking verbs. The next time that you do a video call, try to think of linking verbs that might be useful to describe the state or change of state in each call. Over time, you will begin to use common linking verbs and adjectives with ease. And that's Everyday Grammar. I'm John Russell. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. The presidential race looks jar-lid tight. We could be in for a long night as voters decide whether Vice President Al Gore or Texas Governor George Bush will be the next president of the United States. It is that close. In 2000, Americans were preparing to elect a new president in November. The United States Constitution limits presidents to two terms. Bill Clinton would be leaving office, so his Democratic Party needed to choose a new candidate. The Democrats nominated Clinton's vice president, Al Gore. Gore chose Senator Joseph Lieberman of Connecticut as his running mate. Lieberman became the first Jewish candidate ever nominated by a major party to such a high office. He was first elected to the Senate in 1988. Al Gore was born in Washington in 1948. He was named after his father, a United States Senator from Tennessee. The future vice president grew up in Washington and in Carthage, Tennessee, where his family had a farm. He studied government at Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and graduated in 1969. That was during the Vietnam War. His father opposed American involvement in that war. But the young Al Gore joined the army and spent about six months of his service as a military journalist in Vietnam. Back in civilian life, Gore again worked as a reporter. Later, he studied religion and then law at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. But he dropped out of law school to enter politics. He was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1976. He became known for supporting nuclear arms control and protecting the environment. Al Gore was elected to the Senate in 1984. He was re-elected six years later. That was after he had tried to become the Democratic candidate for president in 1988. Then, in 1992, Bill Clinton won the party's nomination and asked Al Gore to be his vice president. As vice president, Gore became known for his work on issues involving the environment, technology, and foreign relations. In March 1999, he gave an interview on CNN. During that interview, he talked about his plans to enter the race for the presidential nomination the following year. He made the statement that during his service in Congress, I took the initiative in creating the Internet. He went on to say that he took the initiative in moving forward other efforts important to the economy, environmental protection, and educational improvements. But his comment about the Internet led to jokes and criticism that he was claiming to have actually invented it. The Republicans nominated Texas Governor George W. Bush as their presidential candidate. 
For his running mate, he chose Dick Cheney, a former Secretary of Defense. George Walker Bush was born in Texas in 1946, the oldest child of former President George Herbert Walker Bush. He grew up in the Texas cities of Midland and Houston. He graduated from Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, and earned a master's in business administration at Harvard University. During the Vietnam War years, he was a pilot in the Texas Air National Guard. Later, he worked in the state's oil and gas industry. In 1988, Bush worked on his father's winning campaign for president. Later, he became one of the owners of the Texas Rangers, a major league baseball team. In 1994, George W. Bush was elected governor of Texas. He was re-elected four years later. Several other candidates also ran for president in the November 2000 election. These minor, or so-called third-party candidates, included activist Ralph Nader. He represented the Green Party. He criticized large corporations for having too much influence in America. Pat Buchanan, a conservative, ran as the Reform Party candidate. Public opinion surveys showed that the race between George Bush and Al Gore would be extremely close. The election took place on November 7th. More than 100 million people voted for them. Al Gore received about 540,000 more of those votes than George Bush did. But winning the popular vote does not make someone president. Americans do not directly elect their president. When they vote for a candidate, what they are really doing is voting for electors. The number of electors for each state is based on the size of its congressional delegation, which is based on population. These electors then vote in December in a system known as the Electoral College. The Electoral College officially elects the president. In the 2000 election, there were 538 electors in the Electoral College. To become president, the winner needed a simple majority of 270. Al Gore won the popular vote, but neither he nor George Bush won a majority of the electoral votes. Not that any of this was clear on election night. Bulletin, Florida pulled back into the undecided column. This thing is so wild, wacky, and wooly, nobody knows how it's going to come out. Uh, CNN right now is moving Florida to the too close to call column. Too close to call. Florida is now too close to call. I want to say that again. It's a confusing situation. Now, if you're disgusted with us, frankly, I don't blame you. Florida is a big southern state. It had enough electoral votes to make either candidate the winner. Election officials counted almost 6 million votes on election night. George Bush had slightly more votes than Al Gore, but not enough to avoid a recount. Florida state law calls for a recount when the difference between two candidates is less than one half of one percent of the votes. State recounts normally involve the governor, but the governor of Florida said he would not get involved. That was because the governor was Jeb Bush, George Bush's brother. And there were other issues with the election. Some black voters said election workers had unjustly prevented them from voting. There were also problems with voting machines and ballots. In one area, some Gore supporters 
believed they had voted for Pat Buchanan by mistake. The names were next to one another on the ballot. Democrats said the ballot design was illegal. Republicans said Democratic Party officials had never objected to it. The disputed election results in Florida introduced a new term into popular speech. Americans began talking about chads, whether it was hanging chads, pregnant chads, or dimpled chads, it amounted to the same problem. It meant that a voting machine had not cleanly punched out a bit of paper called a chad when the voter made a choice. As a result, the ballot would confuse a vote counting machine and make the choice unreadable. That, in turn, meant election workers had to look at each questionable ballot and try to decide the voter's choice. All this took place with the nation and the world watching and wondering who would become America's next president. Something else only added to anger and debate over the situation in Florida. Florida's Secretary of State, its chief election officer, Catherine Harris, also happened to be a leader of the Bush campaign there. Governor George W. Bush, 2,912,790. Almost three weeks after the election, Florida officials declared George Bush the winner of the state's 25 electoral votes. That gave him a total of 271. Out of 6 million ballots, state officials said he had defeated Al Gore by 537 votes. But the election was still not over. Gore and his supporters in Florida asked the courts to reject the results because of what they said were the many voting problems. The Florida Supreme Court ordered another count of the disputed ballots. Bush campaign officials quickly appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The court said Florida law did not explain how officials should judge the ballots. The court found the situation in Florida unconstitutional because there were different standards around the state. The justices also said not enough time remained to settle the issue before the Electoral College had to meet. On December 12th, the court voted 7-2 to two to end the recount and 5-4 to four against ordering a new one. Six days later, on December 18th, members of the Electoral College met in each state capital and the District of Columbia. They made the election official. George W. Bush would become the 43rd President of the United States. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. He took office on January 20th, 2001. The election dispute had divided Americans. But less than a year later, the nation was brought together by events that would set the direction for the presidency of George W. Bush. A plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center here in New York City. It happened just a few moments ago. The United States suffered the worst terrorist attacks in its history on September 11, 2001, a day that would be remembered as 9-11. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.